everyone, and welcome to uh, this evening's special webinar presented by the Outwards Archive, or Outwards, as we're known to our friends and family, on the occasion of Earth Day 2022. Let me begin by affirming that Outwards stands in solidarity with all Indigenous people. We acknowledge that our headquarters are located on the ancestral, unceded lands of the Tongva people, who are the past, present, and rightful future stewards of this place. I make this acknowledgement as part of an ongoing commitment on the part of this organization to develop relationships and practices to support Native sovereignty. So you all are already here, and I welcome you, and I don't need to convince you of the urgency of this topic. Our precious Earth will survive, but will we be invited to continue our existence here, or will Earth simply shrug us off? Or, perhaps worst from a justice perspective, will the divide between rich and poor, privileged and non-privileged, be forever exacerbated by the reckless ways in which the rich and other entitled groups of people continue to abuse and batter our beloved planet? These are a few of the questions we're here today to talk about with an incredible panel of queer environmental thought leaders and planetary healers. Before we get started, a quick word about Outwards. We are the first and only national project to record, preserve, and share the stories of LGBTQIA 2S plus elders. We do this work to build community and catalyze social change. To date, we've recorded about 224 interviews in 35 states and Washington, DC especially with what's going on in state legislatures all over the U.S. right now, it could not be more timely or urgent to make sure the queer community's incredible history is preserved in the voices of those who lived it, witnessed it, and made it happen. Our panelists today were interviewed in person in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, Lacona, Iowa, and Berkeley, California. As you can imagine, it takes money to mount these interview trips. It also takes money to put these webinars together, including paying our panelists and moderating. We are committed to always offering these events free of charge to anyone who cares to attend. If you want to help us keep presenting these events, please consider making a tax deductible donation today at theoutwardsarchive.org slash donate. And we are also putting that link in the chat window. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce our moderator for tonight's event. Cal Truman is a climate justice advocate operating out of a transgender intentional community in New York's Hudson Valley. Cal comes from a rural working class background with over 15 years in environmental field work and solar energy. From Northern Maine to Appalachia, they have facilitated environmental conversations in communities across the Northeastern US grounded in an ethic of labor, racial, and gender equity. Please join me in welcoming Cal Truman. Thank you so much, Mason. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to facilitate this conversation. Um, I had a wonderful time getting to know our panelists through their uh, previous interviews for Outwards, and I'm really excited to dig into the environmental aspects of some of the um, some of their stories. So um, I the, the very brief introduction I will give is that um, the focus of tonight's conversation is environmental justice, um, which refers to the ways that inequalities um, are exacerbated through environmental issues. So for example, the prevalence of asthma in communities of color often has to do with pollution levels because fossil fuel generation facilities, you know, power plants are located in communities of color, that sort of inequality um, and in poor communities. So at the nexus of these issues of, you know, income inequality, racial inequality, sexual and gender inequality, we've got you know, the queer community lives in some of these areas at all times, what is the impact on the queer community of the queer community on these environmental issues? So um, we're going to talk broadly about a bunch of things tonight. I'm really excited about it because everyone here has different stories to tell. So I'm going to start by introducing our first panelist, Sharon Day. 
Um, in response to the total lack of HIV education or prevention for Native Americans, Sharon helped create what became the Indigenous Peoples Task Force, um, where Sharon has served as executive director since 1990. In the spirit of Ojibwe tradition, whereby women take care of the water, Sharon has led numerous water walks to bring healing to the natural world and attention to humanity's destructive effect on the environment. Sharon's awards include the Red Ribbon Award from the National Native American AIDS Prevention Resource and the Alston Bannerman Fellowship Award to honor and support longtime activists of color. Sharon is also an artist, musician, and writer. She edited the anthology Sing, Whisper, Shout, Pray, Feminist Visions for a Just World. Sometimes people say um, uh, about two-spirit people that um, we are we are spiritual people, and historically we were spiritual people, and we were name givers, and we were this and that and the other thing. And uh, I like to say, you know, we are everywhere, and we do everything. It was 1998, and um, the county and city were going to widen this road, uh, Hiawatha, and to do so would mean the highway would be within 200 feet of the last natural um, spring in Minneapolis. And um, so people gathered to try to protect the spring, and I went because I was called to, to go. And um, that was about a two and a half year process for, um, for me and my sister and you know, the chief asked us at that time, what will you do for the water? Um, what would happen if all of the women of the world said no more? And um, one of the elders, uh, Jasmine Mandaman, began the water walks in 2003. And uh, 2011, I led my first walk and I've led uh, 14 of them uh, since then. When I lead the water walks, we gather the water at the headwaters of a river, and we carry the water um, every day until we get to the mouth of the river. In our language, um, the word for love is zage, and that means to nurture, and um, to uh, nurture the essence of life. And the mouth of the river, um, we say uh, zagin, and that's a place where all life goes to be nurtured. Today, the mouth of the Mississippi River is a dead zone. And so when we gather that water at the headwaters where it's still pure and clean, and we carry it all the length of the river, when we get to the mouth, um, we give the river a taste of herself. And we say to her, this is how you began, pure and clean, and this is how we wish for you to be again. There was a uh, a time where somebody told me that God is in the water. And as a Ojibwe woman, that really resonates with me because water is a source of all life. And when we carry the water, when we're um, singing those uh, water signs, we're speaking to the spirit of the water. And so um, it's my responsibility then uh, to protect um, life and to protect that which um, brings life into the world. Wonderful. Next up, we're going to meet Susan Griffin. Ever prolific, Susan has published 21 books in every genre. In 1975, she won an Emmy Award for a televised production of her play, Voices. She was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for her 1993 book, A Chorus of Stones was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize two additional times, and has received awards from the Guggenheim and MacArthur Foundations, among others. Her writing has been translated into 17 languages. In 1978, Susan published her foundational work, Woman and Nature. The book connected society's denigration of women to a broader devaluation of the environment, emphasizing the unity of ecological and feminist concerns and inspiring the movement known as ecofeminism.
one of the things about being born in California is that most kids have, a, have an outdoor life. One of the highlights of, of, my, of that outdoor life for me was to go to a Girl Scout camp in the High Sierras. It was a very rough camp uh, in, in the best sense of, of that word. The only building on the whole campsite was a kitchen. Oh, and there were little outhouses, and that was it. We slept outdoors almost every night, except if it rains, and then we, we pitched tents and, and slept in the tents. My real religion always was nature. And, uh, that, that's where I had the, the most profound spiritual experiences. I think that I learned to really feel the presence of trees as beings, not as things. The idea that it had, it has a soul, had a spirit, uh, seemed to me self-evident, just from my direct experience living there in the woods that way. And I've never lost that feeling. It was an insight very early in my work that there's a s severe separation in our culture between matter and spirit. And when I was younger, my first years uh, in college, I was drawn to Marxism, as so many young people are. Marx got rid of spirit, and that's the problem I came to see. Perhaps because um, I love material life. I love taste. I, take, I mean, literally eating, I like to eat. I like, you know, I like beauty. Uh, I like being out in trees, and I like the feel of earth. When I started writing Woman in Nature, that split between matter and spirit became the whole structure of the, of the book. And it's that understanding, that uh, polemic that this culture establishes between matter and spirit is, is really uh, disastrous. There's these very strange um, sort of computer engineer visions that uh, somehow with computers, we can just have our brain be there in the computer and that therefore we'll have eternal life. <laughs> that kind of craziness that you could even entertain such an idea um, comes out of a culture that makes that the split between spirit and matter. That's somebody who, who's, who's never, um, never had a great time in bed and never been in love with somebody else just even in love with them that you even like the way they move across a room. We're in a struggle. We're in a titanic struggle for the survival of the Earth. Life on Earth won't be destroyed, but human life on Earth will be destroyed. And the beautiful Earth that we love, that, that, that is our home, will be destroyed. It won't be the same Earth. Excellent. All right. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Matt Russell, our third panelist. Matt attended Mundelein, I hope I said that right, Mundelein Seminary with the intention of becoming a Catholic priest, then left the path of the priesthood after two years. In 2005, Matt and his partner Patrick Stanley bought a 110-acre coyote-run farm in Lacona, Iowa, which became a model for sustainable farm practices. Matt then served as the Resilient Agriculture Coordinator at the Drake University Ar Agricultural Law Center and Executive Director of Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, an organization empowering Iowans to implement faith-based solutions to climate change. A fifth-generation farmer, Matt was appointed by the Biden administration to serve as the Iowa State Executive Director of the USDA Farm Service Agency in November 2021. I'm a fifth generation Iowa farmer. Uh, my brother and sister-in-law moved back to Anita and are farming with my parents. Um, they grow commodities, corn and soybean and beef cattle, about a thousand acre operation, so kind of again a typical kind of small Iowa family farm. Church was really a part of my family. My dad, his family was Missouri Synod Lutheran, and my mom's side was Catholic. I chose to go to a Catholic school when I graduated from from high school, I wanted to go to a Catholic college, so I, I only looked at Catholic colleges. There was the sense that I kind of wanted to be a priest. I didn't come out to myself until I was 19. I, I knew it, but I wasn't admitting it. 
I just figured out I'm, I'm gonna grow out of this, you know, kind of thing. I mean, I was a good student, had lots of friends, had a really great high school experience, um, elementary experience, 4-H, clubs, stuff. I mean, just, you know, I was always successful. Lots of encouragement from people around me. For me, the church was so profound and powerful in helping me become who I am. But that whole time, in formation, celibate, on my path, I hadn't said, absolutely, I'm going to be a priest, but I kept saying yes to the opportunity to explore becoming a priest. And I had a very a very profound religious experience. It was a dialogue with God, very profound dialogue. And what I heard was, is that I love you as a gay man, I created you as a gay man. My love for you doesn't depend on you being a priest. That's up to you. You get to decide what you want to do. When Pat and I met uh, in 2001, we dated for about three weeks. We come back from dinner, we're sitting outside his house, and he said, my grandparents, prayed together. Every morning they got up and put their hands across the bed and prayed. And then at night they did the same thing. They said, that's the type of person I'm looking for. And my jaw dropped and I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, this is what God is talking about. <laughs> this is it. This is, this is my soul. Welcome to all of our panelists. We're going to let everybody come uh, off mute and turn on their videos. Um, and while that's happening, uh, I will just note that while I was preparing for the panel um, tonight, I noticed that um, when I initially was asked, I thought we were going to be, you know, I was going to be like a certain age younger and then everyone was going to be pretty close in age. And, and that was how it was going to go. And instead, it's actually, we've got a nice bracket of, um, you know, about 15 years between people or so. Um, and so it, it really is just, we've got several, you know, eras all represented. It's really cool. I think we'll have a lot of perspectives um, to bring into the conversation. So um, I'd love to start with um, a question that everyone on the panel can respond to. Um, in your personal stories, each of you spoke to a connection for you between your your own spiritual, your own spirituality, um, your path of whatever that is, and the importance of either stewarding the earth or a connection to the natural world. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you, um, you know, what that means to you. And and uh, I would look. Uh, how about I start with Susan? I'll start with Susan, then we'll go to Sharon and then to Matt. Well, it, it continues on, you know. <clears throat> I'm lucky enough to live in the midst of a lot of trees and I have a very big backyard. It just turned out that way. And I spend a lot of time looking out the window during the COVID lockdown period. And uh, there's a, just an incredible amount of solace there. And I, and I communicate with the trees and the animals out there and the grass and it's, it's very real. It's not, you know, something I've made up or is like a fairy story. It's, it's very real and sustaining. So, and I've done that since, as I said in that video, since at least uh, I was at summer camp, but I think it was before that, that it started, that I, that I had a, a feeling of spirit coming from natural life. That's lovely. Thank you, Susan. Sharon? Yeah, I, um, I live on a, on a farm. Um, a couple years ago when COVID started, I bought this property and um, I have a couple, some chickens and a couple goats and uh, have maple trees that I tap and uh, garden. And I think that that, uh, when things are, you know, uh, worrying me, uh, come home and, um, you know, take care of the animals, tap the trees, make our own maple syrup. Those are the things that um, that remind me on a daily basis that you know there's something beyond ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. 
Matt, how about you? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I really grew up formed by the Catholic Church, and um, right now there's not really a place for me in the Catholic Church, um, but that hasn't stopped my spiritual journey. And so one of the things I think about in, in terms of the natural world and, and my own spiritual journey is coming to a deep understanding of, of diversity and that, that God, the creator, the most powerful tool, it's in, it's in, it's in the spiritual, uh, you know, traditions of, of, of all the great spiritual traditions. Um, it's in the, it's in the morals, it's, it's in our teachings. And it's when you look across nature, it's diversity, right? So God creates with the tool of diversity. And so coming to understand because I I'm gifted as a gay man, that's, you know, it's my superhero power, right? I didn't recognize that at 19, but it really is part of who I am. And so much of my life, I'm so just in awe of, of how I've been invited to embrace and live on, uh, you know, it embodied and being gay is a, a big part of that. And it, it helps me understand diversity differently than, than if, if, if I wasn't different in this way. And so I, I, when I think about the natural world, it's, it's how do we embrace the abundance and the diversity in which our creator has created and recognize that we're part of that. And, and queer identity is really, is really important in this moment to not only help, help us embody who, you know, accept who we are as, as queer people, but it's a real gift to the world right now. Um, and, and I'll say more about this later, but I really think that when I, when I think about the, the attack on transgender youth, particularly, and the, and the incredible courage and braveness of, of young people who, who stand up in the face of that, they're, they're showing us what it means to be human in a, in a, in a deeper way that we historically haven't really experienced yet. Um, and, and it is in that sense of diversity and their courage that are drawing us into understanding there is a path forward and it, there's going to be a lot of resistance. People are not going to necessarily welcome this transformation that we're in. Um, but, if, but if we embrace the transformation, 20 years, 50 years, by the end of the century, we will be living in a world that's better than it's ever been. But if we fail to rise up and embrace that challenge before us, then the catastrophe is, is, is unlike anything we've ever experienced as, hum as humans. We're living in that moment. And, and I, I, I constantly reflect on, as a gay man, what does that mean for me in this moment to be part of joining with, with all peoples to figure this out? Yeah, the clock's really ticking. You're right, we're in a cataclysmic moment. But when haven't we been in a cataclysmic moment, I guess? Um, I would love to give another question to Susan. Um, you mentioned in the can excerpt I, that, oh, so I, sorry. Please, yeah. yes, would you like to respond? Go I ahead. want to respond to what Matt said just very briefly, and then I'd love to hear your question. Um, I think that transgender people at this point and gay people in general are very important at this moment because it's splitting apart the idea of male and female, which is a very corrupted idea. It doesn't arrive from bodily organs or anything physical. It's an ideology in which we separate action from compassion. The female is supposed to be more compassionate and soft and the male is supposed to be action and tough and, and capable of cruelty really. And that separation is necessary in order to run this civilization, quote unquote, the way we do, which is to commit genocide at times, war crimes, rape. You know, that to separate compassion from action is very important. So we need to change our whole idea of gender and, and queer people and trans people really challenge the idea of gender which is crucial at this moment. To be honest, I was going to ask you to sort of go in that direction um, and speak a little bit to um, what you see as the damaging consequences of the split between 
matter and spirit when we when we get caught up in in um sort of uh these these heady things and forget that we are physical beings on a physical planet with physical yeah. limitations yes well that that split is is it, it, it it's destructive it's self-destructive it makes us destructive creatures on the face of the earth because we feel like oh here's a piece of land well i can just do whatever i want i can make a cement factory or you know create uh, have nuclear power and irradiate the whole thing and make it toxic so no animals or people can live on it or nothing will grow i can just do that because it's 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 it doesn't have a spirit it's just matter the, t the term uh that was coined i think it was probably in the 19th century is dead matter you know it's dead it has it has no insides at all and um so it's a very destructive way of looking at the earth and uh I'm, I was just reading D.H. Lawrence's studies in classic American literature again for about the 20th time. And in his essay on Dana, uh, what's his name? I remember two years in the mast. Um, he talks about how uh, gradually in, in our culture, we have lost our connection with water, with fire and with earth. We only connect to those things with, through machines. And 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 that's uh, a a lost knowledge, and it's profoundly a lost spiritual knowledge. Water has a spirit, soil has a spirit, fire has a spirit, and we've lost that connection. So um, it's 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 a tragedy, really, that we're living in every day. Yeah, I think I think that. For me, I'm I'm hearing that and I'm agreeing with you, and I'm also thinking, you know, the it depends it depends very much on who is we, right? When you're when we're talking yes. about like our culture, who's we? Because not everyone has lost that, but it is definitely the dominant ideology in the United States for absolute sure, and most of the Western world for absolute sure. That's, that's a better way to put it. Yes. No, you're for, fine. Yeah. Just very thought provoking. Um, Sharon, I wonder if you could pick up on. Um, the the point of you know water having a spirit you've talked about this as well in the water walks that you lead um which sound incredibly powerful um could you talk about those a little bit um and i have a follow-up question um after that to sort of expound but i'd love to hear you discuss that a little bit um beyond what you said in the intro video if you don't mind and most most indigenous people believe that everything has a spirit and um you know, I I have experienced this uh, myself in in real time. Um, it was in uh, when I was initiated into the Medewin, and Medewin is um, translates into English something like the Grand Medicine Society. And to become a Medewin means you study for a year, and you ask uh, the grandmothers, uh, Miss Wayne Don, we Medewian, I wish to become Medewin, and they. Mm -hmm can tell you yes or no. And then you, if they say yes, then you study. And at the end of the year, um, you stand at the door of the lodge again and ask again, Miss Wayne Dunn, we Medea. And if they tell you to come in, then you 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 enter. But if if you if they feel like you there's something that you haven't um, understood yet or Maybe something in your own life that needs to change. You know, they, they'll say, Baka, wait. And then you go through again. Mm -hmm. uh, well, during that year, um, I was studying, and uh, there was um, a, an instance where I was in a ceremony. And uh, there was another queer woman, uh, Marcia Gomez, uh, was killed that year. And um, so uh, somebody asked me um, uh, to go into this cer ceremony and, and pray for her. And uh, the dancers came in and they, they wear jingles on their dress. So I had my eyes closed and I could hear them dancing in. And I, I was singing along with the song and I could feel them coming. I could feel the vibrations uh, from them. And, um, and for the length of that ceremony, I could not open my eyes because um, I could see them in my mind's eye. 
but I couldn't open my physical eyes because like I wasn't worthy of gazing on such a beautiful sight. And for the rest of that year, I could feel the vibrations in everything. If I was sitting on a wooden bench, I could feel the vibration. It only lasted um, for a year, but sometimes somebody would come and tell me like their illness or something, and I could, I could feel them. Um, so we believe that the, everything has a spirit. And uh, I just want to say too, um, you know, we are in a critical time, but we've been there before. You know, there were 50 million indigenous people inhabiting North, Central, and South America. And at the turn of 1900, um, there were only several million of us left. There was such um, a mass genocide that, that it changed, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the levels of gas that were released into the atmosphere. Mm. So, um, you know, I think we cannot ever forget um, those things that have happened that we try to forget. Because when we forget them, then we're able to commit them again and again and again. Just the people are different. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you for bringing that up. I think I had a follow up question, but I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's right. Um, I think that stands alone. Thank you, Matt. Can I ask you um, a little bit about the the so agriculture important? Obviously, we have to feed everyone on the planet. There's a lot of people. Agriculture is how we make that happen. Um, agriculture has a lot of power to, um, you know, sequester the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere into the soil and like net be a be a benefit to the climate crisis. But um, as of right now, agriculture is contributing to the climate crisis and is, you know, the tenth greatest emitter of greenhouse gases. And so, you've talked about um, regenerative agriculture practices on your farm. I'd love to hear more about like in general or in specific um, how you approach that. Um, what you're doing or what you think needs to be done in the sector? Yeah. Um, well, I like to think of agriculture as it's, it's, it's humans um, uh, managing nature, like participating with and, and, and managing nature in order to solve human problems. And, and we used to say 10,000 years, it looks like it might be a little longer than that, that humans have been, have been, managing nature in a way to produce food. So, we, so we've got a long history of, of knowing how to, to work with nature to grow food. Um, we've also now you know, started to do that to, to do other things like um, you know, fiber and, and other materials. Um, but we're really on the cusp of a really enormous agricultural revolution. Um, and, and we have like, you know, millennia millennia of of millenniums of knowledge to draw from from all over the planet from from the whole history of humanity and, and we can draw on all of that and where agriculture is going it has to right this isn't it's not an option of if we're going to get out of the environmental crisis that we're in we have to embrace agriculture as part of the solution and the big shift coming out of the fossil fuel era is we we really we use the fossil fuels to force nature to do what we needed it to do, right? So we, we really got into producing um, stuff, uh, you know, food and then fiber and fuel and some other things. But we used we used fossil fuels to force nature to, to, to solve our problems, right? Well, the big shift is that we have to shift to, to partnering with nature to solve these problems. And so Food is always going to be the biggest part of agriculture. But from here on out, it's going to be a smaller and smaller percentage of, of how we are partnering with, with nature to solve our problems. So we have to make this incredible shift, but it's, it's possible. The science is pointing to it. We have you know, thousands of years of tradition and peoples and, and seeds and knowledge to draw on 
and we have amazing technology that's right at our hands as well. So just put all of this together. When I think about like carbon farming, we're going to have to we're going to add to the mix. How do we grow things in such a way that we're adding to the the products or the solutions that we're that we're sequestering more carbon than we're emitting? We don't know how to do this, right? We haven't done this before, so we we have we have to figure out how we accelerate the carbon cycle and the water cycle and the nutrient cycle, not just to produce food, but to produce, produce these other environmental benefits. And you can't do that forcing nature to do what you want it to do. You have to do that by partnering with nature. And we're seeing this around the world where people are starting to lean, to lean into this and, and, and figure it out. And what I like to say is that when you look at the things that we need to do, there's there's, there's five practices, you know, we, we need to till less, we need to grow a wider variety of crops, we need to integrate livestock into our systems, um, we need to grow something all the time, so this, you know, fallow and plowing and, flat and fallow, and um, so we have to do all of these things. What's interesting is, is that the pioneers for all of these things that we're doing right now, whether it's cover crops or no-till or managed grazing, farmers. Farmers are the innovators, the, and, and the people who are closest to the land who are managing it. Agribusiness is not the most important innovators in the system. Farmers are globally. So I'm biased because I'm a farmer. Um, what we're trying to do on our farm is, is, you know, take our 110 acres and managing it in a way that produces food, produce and, and, and grass-finished beef. But then also think about how we're managing this with, with increasing woody vegetation, the rotational grazing, increasing the variety of what's being grown. Um, and it's hard work, but it's also incredibly life-giving to, to be partnering with you know, our own farm and connecting with other farmers to figure this out. So that's, that's where I see agriculture going. We're, 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 in, we're in the most consequential agricultural revolution that needs to happen in the next 20 years, right? <laughs> but it's all possible. Wonderful, thank you. Great to hear that. Um, do you know uh, Robin Kimmer's book, Reading Sweetgrass? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Native American, I'm sure Sharon knows about this, Native American practices for centuries before. You know? I think one of the difficulties, you know, um, is, you know, farmers um, being left out of the um, Clean Water Act as a point source of um, pollution. And in Minnesota, 93% yeah. of our crops um, are not food. Um, you know, they're grown for biofuel and feed for cattle. And that, um, uh, you know, I, sat, I served on the Clean Water Council in Minnesota for about three years. And I kept asking the question, when are we going to work with farmers um, here in Minnesota to begin to have them plan for when they actually do have to grow food to feed the world? Because right now, like you said, 93% of the crops are grown for biofuel and cattle. Um, you know, how are we working with them to help them um, move into these, um, you know, into sustainable farming and regenerative farming and farming that really, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Matt, if you'd like to take that. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I take the approach that, that this is gonna be at scale and it's gonna be broad. And so I, I'm actually, I think that we're going to to still need some liquid fuels, and I think we're going to need to figure out how to grow those as opposed to dig them up. So, so instead of digging up the carbons that are that are buried in the ground that are stored there, yeah. time to leave all those in place. Right. And are there ways in which we can partner with nature to 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 what we're what we need to limit what we're doing with those with that type of carbon technology, but that which we still do, we need to be growing it. We need to be growing it and, and it needs to be integrated. Um, and we're, that's part of the big question is we're not doing a very good job of integrating that. 
Um, we're not doing a very good job of unleashing the power of people to be creative. It's a, it's a very top-down heavy, you, you know, kind of global industry. I, for an example, I was, at a, I was at an event where a seed company was talking about that, you know, their investments in technology can take 10 or 15 or 20 years to get to a new tech, you know, a new seed trade. And I thought, you know, farmers can do things in, in five years, farmers can pivot and, and, and do these amazing things. The fastest point of action, the most cost-effective point of action for change is the far, is farmers themselves. But we don't have that system economically. It's not driving that innovation. Um, and we're going to do that with, with, with lots of technology and we're going to do it at scale and small. But right now it's a political choice. Are we, are we choosing, are we choosing to structure our economy in a way that, that rewards that type of innovation or that protects a, a type of innovation that's in many ways globalized and monopolized? See, it's, it's, it reflects this value system that spirit is above matter and separate from it. So the, the whole system is, you know, there, there are the spirit leaders who, who um, you know, are businessmen and don't have anything to do with the soil, and they're the ones who make the decision. And the farmers are beneath him. And then, and then even beneath the farmers are the plants, which also ought to be consulted and can be, you can learn to listen to the plants, touch them. You know, in the in the um, harvesting of uh, wild rice uh, in 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 Minnesota, the the Native Americans there who do, who harvest harvested are able to touch the wild rice and know whether it should be pulled or not. Maybe it's producing at that point shouldn't be pulled. There's a lot more that growing it has to do. You know, so this this sort of sensitivity and being able to listen into the earth is is something that can only be developed if we get rid of this old idea that somehow spirit is superior to matter they're not they're not separate from each other it's what einstein figured out you know but we we took the wrong lesson from einstein but he that's that's what a, a equals mc square means energy and matter or spirit and matter are not separate but what did we do? We separated them and created nuclear explosions. <laughs> when, Great, when, yeah. when you, you know, from my perspective, you know, you know, there are stories of how corn came to be, you know, um, that, that corn, you know, uh, rose um, up through the ground uh, to feed us. Um, uh, you know, when we tap the maple trees, um, you know, there's stories. How, how did we know that? How do we know that that was a medicine? Uh, you know, because we watched the animals. Oh. And, um, you know, to us, one of our medicines, you know, like in our creation story, it came to be when, you know, that first man being walked the earth and could communicate directly with the creator but he knew the hum humans weren't here yet. And he asked the creator like, how will human beings, how will they communicate with you? Because he could talk directly. And you know, there was a plant standing behind him that said, I will be the intermediary. Uh -huh. And that was one of our medicine plants. And that's what we use. We burn that plant to, you know, in the name of that plant, the same means from me to you. And so when you look at plants as being, um, as coming from um, the creator, everything, we're, we're the only species that cannot live without anything. You know, like everything can live without us, but we can't live without anything. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about sovereignty in my culture, sovereignty mm -hmm. um, as indigenous people. Yeah. And of course, you know, um, most of that sovereignty was, um, taken away from us via treaties that have never, not one of which has been honored. But in those, um, and, and, but in our sovereignty, I look at that as it begins with me. And that means that I have the agency to create reciprocal relationships with uh, my chickens, my goats, my corn, my squash, my apple trees. You know, my chickens, it's so simple. 
I take care of them. I protect them from the coyotes and uh, the other foxes, the other creatures. They in turn, and I feed them. They in turn give me eggs, which I then give to my friend Paul, who comes and helps get rid of the buckthorn. You know, like it's it's agency to make those reciprocal relationships. And mm -hmm. we have lot, when I say we, I mean the dominant culture in this country have lost those relationships. That's mm -hmm. why we can poison the water. That's why we can um, put 10,000 tons of fertilizer right now, this very minute in the Minnesota River Valley that are, that are gonna go down to the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf and then we have a dead zone. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's so important to understand reciprocity is it's a choice. It's either reciprocity or do domination, you know, and domination kills and it comes back to kill us too in the end, you know, the dominators. And, you know, right now, I think we're living in a world where we're flirting again with world domination and you look at Putin and the invasion of the of U, the Ukraine and this the the big worship of Trump that was going on in this country and and it's it, it's it's an illusion it's all an illusion. So I think this oh sorry I'm instead sorry. of living in in a, in a reciprocal relationship with nature which is level you know it's level we have to be domineering we have to be in control and and that that accelerates. If you're raised in a in a culture, as as most white people are, uh, of do dominance and not reciprocity, you end up f fearing a lot. If you're not in a dominant position, you end up in this terrible state of fear. And one of the things you fear is death. And uh, you know, death is inevitable. It comes to all of us, so it's, it's useless to be afraid of death. But but we there's a very subtle illusion that people like trump give you he's he's a you know he's a classic strong man and um he, the 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 unstated illusion behind uh, his advertised uh, strength is that he won't die that he's he's deathless he'll prevent you from dying that's why victory in battle is so terribly important to putin for instance, if he can have victory in battle, then he 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 actually wins against death. So so that's the secret behind this worship of, of a strong man who's always ends up being unjust to just about everybody and terrible for just about everybody. Why in the world do you think does anybody follow Trump or Putin? Because he he represents this myth, this I, I don't mean to say myth, but lie that somehow we can dominate death, dominate the whole life cycle. I'm glad you brought that into the conversation, Susan, because I was going to ask you about it. So thank <laughs> you. I wanna bring in a couple of questions from the audience um, while we still have a little time left. Um, this one is from Priscilla Ibarra. Um, and the question is, it seems to me that there are two different we subjectivities in play during this conversation. So when we say we, there's a couple of things we might mean. The mainstream modern Western alongside um, indigenous worldviews and practices. Could the panel speak to the movement of restoring lands to native nations whose cosmologies deconstruct the binaries that the panelists speak to as undermining healthy relations among all entities? Um, and I can even expand on that a little bit more because that's what we need um, and say like, there are practices of stewardship that have been effective for millennia that we only very recently moved away from with disastrous consequences because of the genocides that we've mentioned. Yes. And so um, I'm interested in, uh, well, I can say answer live, great. Um, so yeah, let's, I would love to let um, Sharon speak to that first, um, if you'd like, no pressure. I'll ask my screen for a minute. Um, so can you just re refresh me a little oh, bit? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, it was a long question. Essentially, um, we're talking about the, the, the question itself says there are two different we, like we do this, we do this in the conversation. 
and one of those we's is the modern Western paradigm. Um, and the other is, as we're talking, like traditional indigenous knowledge and worldviews and practices that have effectively stewarded the land and the planet for millennia until very recently. Um, and the question was whether the panel could speak to you know, restoring lands to Native nations that do the effective stewardship that we're talking about and like maintain that reciprocal relationship. Yeah. I think, you know, there's um, something that if you're around Indian country, you'll see um, talk about land back and, um, and, you know, and being, <laughs> being that we are the, you know, original inhabitants of this continent, North, Central and South America, we are the original stewards of the land and, you know, um, and you know we had all kinds of practices that were, you know, um, down in the Southwest. The uh, folks down there were um, excellent um, farmers, and they used different kinds of irrigation that that made sense. And um, and then when all their water was uh, rights were, you know, they were diverting all the water from the Colorado River before it got to for, for Phoenix, and then you know, and Albuquerque and the tribes below them who were the agrarian folks, um, you know, they, they went to court and they sued them and they got their uh, water rights back. And now they're again, the biggest producers of produce in, in, in the Southwestern part of the United States. Right. And so given that we were the original st stewards, um, you know, we, we believe that any land that was taken from us by the United States government uh, for military install installations, for public parks, you know, um, that land should rightfully um, come back to us. And, um, you know, I, I'm, um, uh, I lived on a little city plot, a little house for 30 years along the Mississippi River. And a couple of years ago, I was given a gift, uh, kind of a lifetime achievement thing. And it was a monetary gift. And I took that gift and I bought 40 acres of land okay. and, uh, and you know we we we're the we're, now I'm the steward of this land yeah. right and um, and we're taking care of the land and we've had so many people come out here and you know get away from the city and retreats for elders uh, we're having a New York City um, theater company come out here in the <laughs> summer for um, residency and you know, we took the deer stands and we repurposed them as um, as um, art and meditation centers. And uh, um, I wish I didn't have the blurry thing because then you could see my windows behind me and see the, the beautiful land. But I think, you know, um, tribes are purchasing land, but really I think, you know, in terms of reparations, any public land, um, ought to come back to the tribal people that they took it from. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. There's a, a just a quick example, by the way, the wisdom of, of indigenous people in California, we've got these wildfires going everywhere. And indigenous people did controlled burns it kept fires and, and we need that bet we need that indigenous practice back and it's very it's very hard to convince the officials to do that but it's they're beginning to try it now but really indigenous people ought to be put in control of that thank you susan and and i can you know i can speak to my the the we or the the identity of myself in terms of faith is very much you know, very much Christian, um, and and w but that's not. <clears throat> when I think of how I'm formed as a Christian, it's drawing me into mystery and it's drawing me into dialogue and it's drawing me not into confidence in my own identity, but but to question and and um, and that's not necessarily <laughs> how all Christians um, are are embracing their faith these days. You know, contemporarily, but I think some of our as a Christian, this notion of abundance, that our, our God, our creator is, is the abundance is enough. 
And abundance doesn't mean extravagance, it means enough. And so when we get to start to talk about land back or reparations, we can quickly move into scarcity, right? We can quickly move into this notion of scarcity, which makes sense, right? Historically, uh, I'm a sociologist, like when, when you're confronted with fear, when you're confronted with, with challenge, it's very easy to, to wrap your head in a scarcity mindset. And then it's an us versus them. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a zero sum game analysis. And I think that's where we are right now with the whole climate, the whole environmental situation, the situation as we're seeing people, particularly in the West, um, move into a more conservative authoritarian kind of position. That's really about holding on to scarcity. When, as a Christian, my faith calls me into abundance. And when I cling to scarcity out of fear, when I say we can't do reparations, oh, we can't do, you know, we can't do this. We, what I'm really saying is I don't believe in a God of abundance, uh, right? Because if we actually believed in the, in, 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 in the Christ that came and transformed the world, if we really believe in, in a God who is ultimately abundant, who invites us into that and, and created us as a part of that abundance, if we actually believe all that, then these conversations become incredibly more easy and, and interesting and solutions. And as, as, as a Christian, my call is to lean into those solutions, to not be the scarcity of we can't talk about that, we can't do that, but to lean into how can we make that happen? And what I think what's really interesting is young people are really ready to have that conversation of how can we make that happen? And I think that's, as Christian, those of us who are Christians, we need to think about what can we learn from young people about who we are as, as a people of faith, because they're asking the right questions. And when we're not paying attention, we're the ones that, and, and I go back to, to young transgender people around the world, but especially in our own country, who are, who are being attacked. Um, they're being attacked because they're raising these really challenging questions about what's possible. And it is out of fear and this notion of scarcity that, that, we're, that, that we're seeing a political movement coming after them. I do not claim any credit for marriage equality. Uh, I, I, I experience it. I have been blessed. I moved back to Iowa, not expecting that my state would be one of the first to, to, to say, you know, to talk about marriage equality. What's really interesting for me is that the attack was, is that marriage, you know, gay marriage was going to destroy marriage. And what we found is that gay marriage, marriage equality, marriage equality strengthened marriage. It made us come to a better understanding of what marriage is. That's what, that's what queerness is doing. It's challenges. What does it mean to be human? Break, break the dichotomy, break the polarity of us versus them, this or that. It's much more mysterious. It's much more profound. And, and leaning into that abundance is, I think, how we bring people together and, and solve these problems. Thank you, Matt. I'm so glad you got to talk about that. I wanted to hear about abundance, and here we are. Sharon, I'm going to pass it over to you because I saw you have a hand, and then I have a, we're getting close to time, so I have one more question for you all. No, I, I simply want to say that I totally agree um, that uh, we need to look to the youth, and um, so I, I, you know, I work at the youth theater, um, uh, work with a lot of young people, and, you know, they're, um, you know, they're, they're so um, smart and, um, and they don't care about if somebody's queer. Um, and, you know, in my culture, we didn't have, um, you know, sure we had genders, but we had like five genders, you know, so oh, that's great. Uh, it wasn't this idea that uh, you're one thing or the other. And I just, I, I wanted to say, there's a, a woman, um, up in Canada, she's also Medewin and she's also a scholar. Her name is Leanne Simpson. And she talks about the resurgence in culture and, and that in this resurgence of culture, you know, it has to be true to the culture. And that is um, accepting um, all of those genders uh, and, and, you know, lifting women up um, that, 
you know, we've been forced to um, adopt, um, you know, these ideas that had no place in our society. And so if anybody's looking for something good to read besides um, uh, and the book that the author Susan was talking about, um, Braiding the Sweetgrass, it, Leanne Simpson, and she has a book called The Way We Always Been, and another book called um, Dancing on Turtles Back. But excellent um, books and talk about uh, the environment, about culture, about talk about it all in much more articulate way than I can. Thank you. You know, and I, I think one of the one of the things that, that we all are um, endangered by from childhood on is to learn to lie about who we are, especially if we're gay or we don't we're we're what you know if we don't belong to one of the two genders we're one of the five you know i love that five genders so learning to tell the truth about who we are is very very it's a cornerstone of all the change we need to make uh, in the world right now to be our to be authentic to be who we really are thank you um, I think that I have time to ask one more question that everyone can respond to. And I want to bring us, I want to square us in the queer lens and the environment or natural lens uh, to end the session. Um, and to do that, I'm going to invite in um, our friend Leslie Feinberg, who wrote the book Stone Butch Blues and is a, an incredible trans author. Um, and early in the book, this, this essentially non-binary in our language now, this butch character, Jess, is having a really hard time at school and getting bullied and her parents don't like that she dresses like a boy and things like that. Um, and I'm gonna read a very brief excerpt and then I want us to talk about it. So the excerpt is, um, I hurried out to the pond to catch pollywogs in a jar. I leaned on my elbow and looked up close at the little frogs that climbed up on the sun-baked rocks. Caw, caw. A huge black crow circled above me in the air and landed on a rock nearby. We looked at each other in silence. Crow, are you a boy or a girl? <laughs> caw, caw. I laughed and rolled over on my back. The sky was crayon blue. I pretended I was lying on the white cotton clouds. The earth was damp against my back. The sun was hot, the breeze was cool. I felt happy. Nature held me close and seemed to find no fault with me. And so I'd just like to close with thoughts, ideas about this idea of like queerness in the natural world and like the idea of the natural world as a place of refuge and a place of um, refilling, you know, um, any sort of depleted like energy, you know, things like things like what, what connection do you have between the natural world and your own like queer identity. Um, I think that would be a nice way to wrap. Um, mm -hmm. And whoever wants to go first, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll point to you so we don't all talk at once. Anyone have thoughts on this? Oh, don't all go at once. <laughs> uh, Matt, would you like I'll, to talk? I'll just say, yeah, I'll say a couple, a couple of things here. That Please. for me, it's about letting go of my assumptions. That's what my life has been about, right? I've, 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 I've had a really wonderful life. I mean, I have, I have a family. Um, I have this farm. I have this career. I, I have this really wonderful life, and mm. part of that has been letting go of my assumptions, right? being willing to embrace the mystery and being invited into seeing things in a new way, including myself. Um, and I think that's, that's the opportunity that we're in. And it is why people, it's a very profound thing to be invited into this kind of change. And it makes sense then that some people, even in mass are, are pulling against that, right? Because they want to hold on to their assumptions. They want to, but that's, that's, for me, nature and people and possibilities is this invitation into seeing things in a new way, letting go of our assumptions, and, and being called into, into great mystery and possibility. I, I think, um, uh, Matt, one of the ways you can do that is that you have uh, a, both a, a relationship that's solid and you have a community that's solid. So the kind of, to be, dwell in uncertainty, which we need to do, and to be eccentric and open to innovation and open to the, what the plants are telling us, the trees and the rocks. We need 
uh, safety, a sense of safety, not ultimate safety. There's nothing that can protect us from the life cycle, but the safety of others who care about us, you know, nurturance from uh, mutual nurturance. And uh, we, we have a society that is all about competition and who's the fastest and who's the strongest and who can, who can assemble the most cash in their bank accounts, you know? And really what we need is who can give and take, who can, who can love, you know, that's what we need. We need a whole different value system. And feeling, it's not, it's not separate from a feeling of, of mutuality. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Kel, for, um, for reading that passage. Um, I actually knew Leslie, uh, she came to, he came, they, came to our two spirit gatherings um, that we that we held here in Minnesota back in we started in 1988 and then they go back and forth between Canada and the United States but um, uh, you know I, I agree with Matt um, my, my life's been very blessed and um, yeah I I just feel so blessed and and, and also to be surrounded by um, elders and, um, and young people, both who are kind of, um, you know, the elders for their wisdom and the young people for, you know, always, always questioning, always questioning. And, and uh, you know, Dr. Emoto said, um, you know, as adults, we need to reduce the harm that we're doing to the earth in the hopes that this next generation can take it much farther than we ever did. And, you know, I grew up in the sixties. We thought we were going to change the world. We did not, you know, we failed miserably. And, um, but I do have hope when I look at these young people and, and, um, you know, my grandchildren, um, the young people I work with, that's where the hope is. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all. Um, and Sharon, I wouldn't say you didn't change the world at all. I mean, I'm 37 and I'm living in a transsexual compound in the Hudson Valley. And, you know, I have access to all of these medical services covered by my insurance that I would never have expected. There's also like, I can have, you know, any job that I can have qualified for, you know, like there's a lot of things that like I have access to that I absolutely thank each of you and also, you know, everybody who's been doing this work for like making available to me. So I wouldn't say you didn't change the world. I wouldn't say that at all. Um, I think for time we have to wrap. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for the privilege of letting me moderate this conversation and ask you all these cool questions. I'm going to pass the mic back, I believe. Am I passing the mic back? No, I think I think the mic remains remains where it's been. Okay, um, great. Yeah. Um, I'm, so, I'm, yeah. In that case, I'll say thank you all for joining us. Um, these events are provided to the public free of charge. To support this programming, please visit the outwardsarchive.org slash donate. The link is in the chat. Um, and I think that's the end of the webinar. If you want to follow me on socials, the best way to do that is to actually follow my house. We are at the.rev.olution, um, R-E-V-E, Rev Olution. I'll put that in the chat on um, Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon. So, um, but yeah, it's been very wonderful to um, host. Jack, are Thank there any you. final words? Thank you, Cal, for hosting us. You were great. Yeah, just tremendous gratitude to Cal and Susan and Sharon and Matt for the incredible um, generosity and wisdom and thoughtfulness that you brought to tonight's conversation and uh, wishing everyone a um, joyful, peaceful, nourishing, whatever kind of Earth Day you want to have um, and a beautiful night. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you so much.